angry with myself. All right, turn to your Bibles. And let's go to the Lord in prayer before we do anything. Sister Grant, would you please pray? Our kind, gracious Heavenly Father, and dear God, we are truly grateful this morning, Lord, that it is another Lord's Day, and we can gather in your house, Lord, to worship you. We thank you, Father, for your protection as we travel on the highway, dear Lord, even something to us. We pray to you, Lord, how you have sustained us during the week, dear Father. You must victory in our soul, and Lord, we are able, dear Father, to overcome. Thank you, God, for the Sunday school hour, dear Lord. We pray, dear Father, that you bless each teacher. Bless us, dear God, Lord, and you bless your word to us, dear Lord. And help us, dear God, that we can be in your word and apply to our hearts and lives that we can be the people that you want us to be. We are grateful, Lord, for every blessing. And God, we ask you to have your way this day. Be in the morning's worship service, Lord. We ask for going to be God upon the song leaders, the choir director, the musicians, the choir, Lord, and use us to your glory and to your honor. We ask you, God, to be blessed this morning and have your way in Jesus' name. <coughs> okay. Let us turn to our Bibles to Exodus chapter 9. All right, we have been studying the plagues. Let my people go. Uh, what are the um, first three plagues you studied last week? The blood. Sister Noreen. Frogs. Blood in the water, okay. Flies. And lice. Lice. You know the itchy stuff that our kids bring home from school? Okay. This week, we have three more. What are they? Wilmer? Okay. I know. <laughs> Brother Anthony? This week, the, the, the sickness of the animals, the boils, and the hail. Okay. They call it the moon. The plagues was livestock, boils, and hail that we're going to talk about today. Three. Okay? By the way, many times you haven't really paid much attention to it, but each one of those plagues is a symbol of, of different things, too, besides which we didn't go into, and I actually didn't pull out all my past studies on that. But there's good lessons there for spiritual applications for us. Okay. Um, in our Bibles, in Exodus chapter 9, Okay, let me ask you a question. It's not in your lesson, it's not in the thing, but what do you think, brother? Brother Watson, why do you think that God hardened Pharaoh's heart? I believe why he hired the people of God was because he wanted the people of Egypt to know that he is God. Okay, he wanted to show his power and his yep. strength. Yep. Sister Marisa, since you said you covered that with the little children the other day, tell me what the children were saying and what you had to say about it. We had a really deep class um, <laughs> in our Sunday school class last week, and we talked about that God hardened his heart. I believe, first of all, was to exalt him, and all that, but I believe it was because God will do that if he sees the intent of our heart and our actions, that we keep saying no and keep playing with God and lying and, and playing that little game that, uh, yes, no, yes, no, there comes a point where God 
we'll harden our heart and there's nothing we can do about it. It's actually a very scary place to be. And I think that that, that happens just like there's a scripture that says your conscience gets uh, seared. seared, that you become hardened completely. And there's nothing you can do about it because God does that to teach us not even to teach that person a lesson, but to teach people around us a lesson. Uh, that's what Brother Wattler was saying, so that other people would see. Okay, one of the things I want to ask the class for you to think about, because a lot of these questions, I don't want you to answer them, but I want you to think about it. Have you ever, or were you a victim of having a hard heart? Have you ever seen someone whose heart has been hardened? Or were you a victim of a hard heart? Okay, how many have seen? I'll just go that far. You were a victim, God have mercy. Okay, many of us have seen. And I will go to the, the place to say that yes, some people's heart was hardened. And God took his great big sledgehammer and says, one more try. And that person was broken. That I have seen in my lifetime. People that have been so hard against the gospel, so hard against salvation, so hard against the truth. And then all of a sudden, it's like God's light just penetrated. And it's because God said, one more time, I'm going to give him an opportunity. One more time. And I think this is actually what is happening to Pharaoh as we're coming along too, because we come to the point where he finally says, which we're going to be setting later on, let my, uh, I'll let the people go. And then he changed his mind again. But he had a ray of light. <clears throat> he got hit so hard that he had a little ray of light. And he let him go. And then he changed his mind. But there's a very dangerous condition. And this is what, I, as I was reading, and he, he, his heart was hardened, and his heart was hardened, and he said no. And he keep reading that over and over, all down through these plagues, nine times, and he... No, he, he hesitated no. And his counselors even had hard hearts, according to what I'm reading here. Those that were around him, their hearts were hardened too. So here we see all this going on in, in Pharaoh, and I see this is the way sinners are today. God is not an exception of person. God always carries the same, and this is what's so exciting about God's Word, is that the Word from the Old Testament, the New Testament, applies even to our generation today. How many times does God deal with people today? Over and over and over again. He sends uh, ca catastrophes into their lives. He, he, he sends trials. He sends problems. He sends situations into their lives. And what happens? They, oh yeah, God is doing this to me, and they mention God, or they think about God for a moment, but yet their heart is hardened. They're not moved. And all God is trying to do is just shake them. I'm God. I'm all powerful. I have control of you. But they still continue the hard heart. And these, these things that we read in the Old Testament, all these plagues and all these things that came about to the people of Israel are such great lessons to us that we do not fall into that same pattern. Now, as a child of God, being saved, Brother Ignacio, what do you think could happen to me if I harden my heart? God will be able to use you. God will be able to be able to deal with you. Okay. How can a servant or a child of God have their heart hardened, Sister Kayla? Do you believe that that can happen? It depends. It depends harden against what. Because if your heart, if you're a servant of God and your heart is hardened against God, and all that kind of happen, because you're not, then you're no longer a servant of God. Right. But can it happen to a servant of God or a child of God? That can it be, happen? Can that become like that? Sure. Okay. What? And what is the process that would lead towards that? What, what happens that causes them to be pushed to that position? I, I think like every Christian, everybody gets to a level, a certain level, and that God is talking to you about something specific. It could be two different ways. God is talking to you about something specific, and you don't want to change that. You don't want to. You don't want to change that, or you don't want to overcome that. And you let those little things, like we've heard so many times, the little foxes get in, and eventually, 
then you become complacent in your in your situation and you can become hard just sitting there in the pew all the time hearing the same thing and thinking that you're okay that's one thing the other thing is that you can always like we've heard and seen even recently that you let your guard down and you don't guard your salvation, you don't take care of your salvation, and you relax and you think that everything's okay, and your heart can become hardened. You can just okay. leave God. And, and she was talking, I was thinking about a, a, a child that lies all the time. And a child that lies all the time, they become hardened. That they think that actually what is coming out of their mouth is the truth. Because, and adults do the same thing, but thank God I don't have to deal with that kind of people so much. <laughs> but as you work in the circular world, uh, circular world and you work out there in schools and you go to school and you deal with people that are habitual liars. Those people have hardened themselves within to where it, it, they think it's really true. And it's like people many times sitting in a pew that have heard the truth, have heard the gospel, have lived a Christian life, but like the sister said, something comes up against them and clashes. And they don't want to surrender that, or they don't want to give up that, or they don't think it's necessary. And they, the first few weeks, the first few days, they, they sit in the view or they hear the message and they feel guilty. But then after a while, they're excusing themselves. And then after a while, they hear preaching that, they say, oh, well, that doesn't, that doesn't affect me. When they've been doing all this all this time, they become seared, hardened against it. This is the danger. I am sure that Pharaoh, as he saw uh, the boils appear, on the skins of his servants and on his families and all, uh, uh, all around him. And as he saw the great big balls of hell coming down from the heavens and things being destroyed, that at a, there was like a, a flash of, there's a God out there and those people have an almighty God. I need to let these people go. But then he said, no, why should I? They're my people. He begins to justify himself again. And many times, people that serve God and this is the danger when you're serving God for a long period of time and you're not on fire okay and what do I mean by being on fire sister Millie to be on fire to me is to be in a sense it may seem contradictory to, but to be submissive towards him because what I was thinking right now actually that you brought that up is the like, likening to a hardening heart to me is someone who thinks they're, they're up there already. I know everything I need to know. This is my life. I'm in control of my life because I'm down here. They seem to forget that God knows all and he's the one that's supposed to be running your life. They figure, I'm here. It's my life. What I say goes. Okay. So there's a grave danger of us serving God for a period of time and having a hard heart. Do you ever ask yourself, Lord, it, do I have a heart that is soft and tender before you? Or is my heart beginning to be callous? How many of you ever had calluses on your hand? Okay. How many calluses, Sister Murner, have you ever had on your hand? On my hand? Uh-huh. All around here. Okay. How did you get them? I guess sleeping and cleaning. You know, because that's how you hold up room and the... Okay. Uh, who else? Raise their hand. Brother Walker, you're a good one. Uh, where have you had your calluses on your hand? Okay, main across here. Okay, anybody else? Besides having them here. Okay. Usually, the callus will start probably here, right? Okay. Then it goes here and here before you know it. But I've seen men and even women that lived in the country that worked hard doing all kinds of things. Their whole hand was calloused. Is that right? Uh, today, you don't see that too much. <laughs> but in those days, you used to see it. They, even on their fingers, as Sister Marisa said, on their fingers, there was calluses. All this in here, because it's not just the sweeping or the hole or the shovel, or, but it was grabbing things and holding on to them and and we didn't have when I grew up we didn't have those nice leather gloves that you can get over in Walmart and all these places today we had to use our bare hands and your hands were calloused even I uh, from picking cotton my, my my fingertips were calloused and and my hands were very rough and, and hard to be a lady when I was young because of the labor that I would do 
So this is the same thing of my heart. I get one callus in one place, but before I know it, there's another callus on this part, and then on this part, and then on this part, and before I realize it, my whole heart is calloused and hardened. In other words, nothing can get through there in my capacity. It, it takes God to scrape all that away to be able to reach us. But we have lost our tenderness. And this is a danger because even I'm, I'm, I'm sure that Moses, and I'm not going to say 100%, but Moses was going up the fifth and the sixth and the seventh and the eighth time and the ninth time and the tenth time to Pharaoh. And God was telling him, go back up again. I'm going to send another plague. I'm gonna, and, and Moses had to be thinking, uh, come on, let's get this work done. <laughs> I'm here for a purpose. And he was beginning, I would think, as a human, it was just beginning to take a toll on him physically too. So I think about this. We as Christians, as we journey in our Christian life, we have to be very careful that we keep a very tender heart before God and not allow life nor its circumstances to callous us because situations can callous us. All right, Sister Amber, no wrinkle face. Please tell me, give me one example of how something in your life could callous you. Yes, ma'am. Like for example, I'm going to be very personal. Um, we have a problem with communication. And if something is not addressed, or if it's unaddressed, that could um, produce a palace in me where my whole family and my relationships come up that same problem. Um, communicating something that bothers me or even something like um, telling them that I love them. Okay. Uh, Sister Kayla's raising her hand back there saying, hey, we can't hear, so they want you to well, start around and speak But she also has another brother in the side can. Yeah, I know. This is where it is. We, we, we cut them off over here. We turned it off. Okay, Sister. Loud. You got it. <laughs> I was saying that um, a situation, for example, like with my family, where... Um, it's very hard to communicate things, like even things that bother you, or even saying that we love each other. It's it's um, it's just we're not very expressive, and that can produce calluses in my life with other relationships where things will not get addressed if I'm bothered by it, or things I won't express them. Um, to the best of my ability, even to God in my relationship, in my prayer life, that can produce calluses where I, I won't feel like I need to do that, where I won't feel like I need to um, express myself in certain ways. Okay, because that, that can lead you to feel, I like the way she applied it into her spiritual life, because it can get you, it can get you to the place where in her, her thing, well, I don't really need to communicate because God knows. And we're family, we understand each other, so they know how I feel, or they just have to take it because that's the way I am. But, and then you get the same attitude over into your own spiritual life, which is very good, uh, Amber. Live by that, honey. If you lead it into your spiritual life, well, God understands me. He sees what I'm going through. No, God wants to know. This is why many people don't have the effectual fervent prayer they need. It's because they take it for granted that God knows. Yes, God knows. But God wants you to tell Him that you need Him in that moment of those things that you know He already knows. Because I believe that God, if we're depending on God, if God is like, we say He's our Father, but it's even deeper than that. Um, our fathers... I never had one, but I have seen it in my girls. They love their father to be. They respect their father. That's the same way we do with God. They, they tell him all kinds of things. They want to see him laugh. They want to see him happy. They want to see him well. Same thing we put, can go over to God. But I know for a fact, in both of the girls, there are certain things they do not tell their father. Right? right? Because they feel like it's very personal. 
and we don't want to worry him, we don't want to put that pressure on him, and all these things. Well, this thing, the same thing, we carry these things over into our prayer life, to our Heavenly Father. And these are the things that we can become callous with thinking that God doesn't need to know. But God wants us to know that He knows every aspect, but He wants us to tell Him every aspect of our life. It's not a confessional. It's just like you. And I have one person that calls me every once in a while and says, I just got to vent. And I take it with a grain of salt and give the, the counsel where I need to give the counsel because the simple reason is many times once we start talking about our situation to God, God begins to tell us. And it's the same thing when I begin to tell you something and I get all these ideas and thoughts. It's the same thing with God. When we pray to God, God begins to put into our mind the, the, how to solve our situations, how to take the right attitude in our situations. He puts it in our heart. He shows us through His Word. But we got to tell Him. That's what He wants. And the reason why many of your situations, especially your younger ones, you can't get through and have the victories over is simply because you haven't just been plain old honest with God. And what happens? You begin to build a callus there. I don't need to, I don't have to, God already knows. And those are the calluses that spiritual people can begin to accumulate in their heart. And it's very dangerous to have one little tip or one little. I'm not a doctor. All right, Sister Marina. You're not a doctor, but you would know. It takes just a few cells of a little something. Uh, like a little piece of a blister, to form uh, a little piece of skin to form a blister, right? Just a few. And that, after a while, you, the blister pops, and then the skin begins to get hard and hard and hard and harder, and it's just a little thing. Start out something little. But before long, if you keep messing with it, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Isn't that right? Okay, this is what happens when we are negligent before God. Where did we get from Pharaoh to him? It's because God, his heart was hardened. And we, as human beings in the world that we live in today, run the risk of allowing things in life to harden our heart to certain things. We cannot lose the compassion for souls. We cannot harden ourselves and think, oh no, well they've heard the gospel so many times, or, or why should I go there? They, Look what they're, they, 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 are the, they have their things and they don't, they're not going to take time. And we become careless and we lose that compassion. And it begins to be form in us something that before long we don't have a compassion for souls. We could just say, oh, I'm a child of God. If they ask me, then I wouldn't say, if I don't, then I, it's not necessary. We begin to lose little things. And that begins to form a little crust, little cells in our hearts where we lose that Fer, fer, fervor? Fervor. Fervor. fervor for God. And Pharaoh was hardened and it took something very serious in his life for him to say, and he didn't keep his word after that, but just to say, go. And we do not ever want to be in that position where God will hardness to such a degree where it takes have you ever thought all you that are parents and young parents here that because of your disobedience and because of your hardness of heart that God will take that one you have in your arms from you or your firstborn sometimes God has done it but God does not always act that way so severely but we have to think if God did it before why is he going to make an exception of me? Why should God make an exception of our generation when he dealt so with his people at that time? Do you think he should? Sister Rose? You think he should make an exception? No? Okay. Tell me why. What is your basis reasons for saying no, he should not make an exception? Okay, she says because it wouldn't be fair that that generation suffered and we didn't suffer anything. Anybody else have an input on that one? Yes. Well, Anthony? I think that 
we we have more knowledge, we have more uh, more of God, more about Him than the people back home. Okay, we do. But there's one thing somebody had mentioned. Come on, Brother Danny. Because of Jesus Christ. Because we have the blood of Christ Jesus, we are so much more responsible than the generations past. And the thing is, we're getting to the point when you start dealing with people that that it is like, oh yeah, I know he died, and I know he can forgive sin. They're taking it so lightly. We cannot take the blood. We cannot take the sacrifice of Christ Jesus so lightly. We have to be responsible for it. So yes, God is not going to be an exception of persons with us. So many times it is healthy for us spiritually, very healthy. And these things we read in the scripture, we read about the hell, we read about the frogs, we read about the lice. How many of you ever had lice in here? Okay, I did when I was three years old. But lice, you boys, lice is those things that get in your hair. <laughs> okay, many of you have, you know the desperation of the itch. Even as a child, you can remember just itch, 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 itch in your head. And there are people that get it, and according to here, they had it all over. On oh, body lice, there's body lice too. So just thinking, God allowed these things. Who am I that God would not allow me to lose my job? Or for to have a car accident? Or like Sister Carla, lost for three hours yesterday. <laughs> Why would God allow that? I, I, I went to be with the sisters. Why did God allow me, with a baby, and an old lady in the car with me, to be running around for three hours in a place where there's all kinds of dangers, because I'm lost. Because this is the world we live in. And we are no different to anybody else that lives in the world. What we have is the blood of Christ Jesus to stand up. God allows things to come upon us, but don't tempt God. Because just as Pharaoh, Pharaoh tempted God, as Pharaoh would not let the people go, so it is many times when we hear the preaching, we, hear, we read it, we read it, because you, my class here, you know I'm on top of you to study your lessons, to do your devotions, to get from the word yourself what is personal. We get all this stuff, and yet, if we're not careful and we decide to follow our own path and our own wisdom and our own thoughts, God will call us to account. <laughs> because God called Pharaoh to account, eventually. And what happens here is we're all responsible but we're no different from other generations that have lived. We, we are different, but we're not different. We're people with souls. But we are different in the sense that we have heard the gospel and we need to give heed to the gospel and live it. And we have said over and over in this class before, and I'll say it once again, we are so blessed when God speaks to us. Even when it's to correct us. <coughs> As much as we despise chastisement, as the scripture says, we are so blessed that God will call us on the carpet and call attention to our condition. So the, the, the thought this morning is, yes, there were frogs, yes, there was hell, but there was something that God saved his people from that because they were not responsible for Pharaoh's decision. How did God save his people from all these plagues. Uh, Brother Johnny. How did he save his people from all these plagues? Yep. He just um, told them to do certain things. For example, like when one of them, when he told them to put the blood on the, on the door, um, he told them, you know, not to so he separated them from the human nature. He, he says that, um, God told him to do certain things. He separated them. Like, for instance, he told him to put the blood on the door. What else did he do? We had one in our lesson today. Brother T, today, what did he tell him to do in our lesson today? Because God protected the people of Israel from the plagues. It was Pharaoh's fault that his people were suffering. But God was protecting his people. 
Something in our lesson today. God told us to do. Okay, there in one of the plagues there was a line drawn. Right. Right. Between Goshen and, and Egypt. Okay. There's something unusual about the plague of the hail. Can somebody tell me about it? I know you caught it. You had to have caught it. Brother Wilbur, you got it ready now? <laughs> The hell. What was unusual about that? that? Go, James. <laughs> okay. It was mingled. Brother Nelson. What happened was that the, any Egyptian that believed uh, and they and they and they listened, nothing happened to them. Right. And those Why? That, Why? What because they put the cattle down. Okay, there you go. God gave those whose heart of the people was beginning to become tender. He gave them a chance. He says, bring your servants in. Bring the livestock that is still alive in. And they will be protected. They will be saved. And the same thing happened. And according to what I was reading this morning, it fell even in Goshen. Goshen, the Israelites had to obey. All of them had to obey. Bring them in, bring them in. Bring them into the fold. That, there's such a spiritual type there that was going to the book of Revelation. Remember what hell symbolizes? The founding of the word, bring them into the fold. I just, well, I'm, but anyway. <laughs> God preserved his people because he gave them a protection in different ways. And when people began to believe, God protected them too. So here we have, yes, Sister Marais, but stand up and speak it my, my, my son actually asked me a question yesterday when we were doing the lesson, and, and it was a good question because he asked, why did God punish the Egyptians when they didn't do anything wrong? It was Pharaoh. And we were just talking about that in the pew, like why we, we think that some of the Israelites had a hard heart, but they were spared. Because you could see it in the desert, how their hearts were, they took it for granted. But my answer to him was, so our actions affect those around us. And I think that's a very good spiritual application for us, that because of our heart or because of our actions, we can cause our families, our co-workers, our spouses, we can take them to hell, but we can take them to have a hard heart too because of our actions. And again, there's a scripture in the Bible that says the blood of the blood of their souls will be on, on us. And it's not just us we're affecting, we're affecting people around us because of our heart. Our, our hard heart. heart. And they're not they're they're not innocent because they have a conscience. But we can be that little push that makes them go the wrong way. Exactly. The, the thought of us, many times we have talked about in our class, is how we are affecting others. I gave you the example yesterday in the gathering we had. Um, Sister Tanya and I were sitting there, and there's the woman walked by that was serving. She says, y'all are from my church, aren't you? And the, that brings me to what Sister Marisa just said. The way we act... The way we are around other people makes a world of difference. It will either give them repugnance of the things of God, which has so happened so much today, or they will be drawn because they see, oh, 
This is a different kind of people. They say they're Christian, but they are really different. Actually, the photographer said to Catherine, I was with her, she said, I've never done so many of these events. I've never been in an event like this one. I feel there's something special, something like family. She was trying to say it. I said, that's the love of God. She goes, that's right, it is. She felt it. She was like, wow, this is nothing I've ever done before. And she's a professional photographer. And even though there were many people there that were not of our congregation, and they were uh, on Chrome, different walks of life, all these people felt, like Sister Marisa says, our influence was going out. And we do not want to be like Pharaoh. Because of Pharaoh being the king, the leader, the, the god of, it, of Egypt, he influenced all these people. And it's not only the Egyptians, because if you read there very closely, it's the Egyptians and the people. There were other nations there present. So here, he is the influence of all these people. And because of his condition, the judgments of God was poured out on all of them. <clears throat> but because we can make a difference, our influence, our influence can flow out to such a degree that it, we may not ever see it. But it's the fact, like Sister Marisa said, we give them one little push the right way or one little push the wrong way. And that's just the way I saw, I saw a hand. Yeah, so you're saying like how we can, how uh, people can either be repugnated by us or attracted to the word. Do you think that repugnance is a result of, well I know it can be a result of us being hard, but is that can also be a result of, of them being hard? That, they're, that, they don't, that they don't like that? That's yeah, the there's, there's a two way street on that. Um, they, they are already hardened, um, but many times most people in the society, the Western world that we live in today, they, are, they know about God. But the problem is, is too many know the wrong things about God and have seen too many bad examples. And it is our responsibility to go over and beyond, even though many times we have to step on what we want, what we think is right, to be able to show a Christ-like spirit. And this happens what people do not want to do. They don't want to go over and beyond and show that Christ-like spirit. That's what they don't want to do. They, it's, we've become selfish in our world we live in today. And we don't realize the influence. You, your influence is not just your, hu your husband or your wife and one or two or three kids. That's, that's not just your influence. Your influence is when you go to the store and how you react to the cashier that may shortchange you or give you too much money, either way. Or how, you, or how you treat someone you walk down the sidewalk or when you're in the, you know, do you know what I do all the time? I don't care what age they are is. If I have to walk between the counter that is here and a person standing here looking at that counter and I have to walk that way because they're back over here, I always say, excuse me. But it doesn't happen today. And you know why? Because people think they have a right. Well, you're standing in the wrong place looking up. I'm gonna walk through. But the fact that I say excuse me makes them... It's the little things that we're losing that we need to input to make an influence. You don't wanna be a pharaoh. Go out and be a saint. <laughs> Thank you.